Today on Real Talk. So, I mean, education is a really key issue. That's been an issue in America as well, just as it is here in the UK. The cost of education, the style of education as well. So that's why we felt it was a good idea to go to USA and do a program on this topic for the Real Talk uh, editions over there in the US. One of the things that makes this program really unique is the fact that it was actually the MTA USA team that completely took over the program um, from the directing and the camera work the whole production side of it, you know, this was their show. So I'd urge the viewers to look at it from that perspective and see this as the first step in their journey uh, in producing their own programs. So we're coming to you with real stories, real issues, and real views from here in the USA. Real stories. Urban life in America is very diverse, fast-paced. You're telling me the prayers of those people, those among our people, weren't accepted? Hmm. Do you really want to monopolize salvation? This is Real Talk USA. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another edition of Real Talk. I hope you've been enjoying this special US edition so far. We've been having a fantastic series with a whole range of discussions about various social and religious issues. Today we're going to be having a look at education and education here in the US. We're going to be looking at if the, if the actual system is being successful and if not, what are the issues and how do we actually go about and solve them. I'm joined by a fantastic panel here in the audience and I'm just going to introduce them for you today. Uh, first of all, I'm joined by Eric Ludka. Welcome to Real Talk. Fantastic to have you here. Eric's the delegate-elect for District 14 here in Maryland. Next, we have uh, Dr. Basir Rodney. Welcome to Real Talk. Uh, Dr. Basir is the Assistant Professor of Education at Webster University in St. Louis. And last but not least, I'm joined by David Murray, who's a former member of the State Board of Education here as well. So fantastic to have you here, and uh, welcome to the show. And I'll be getting your points of view later on in the program as well. Um, of, as usual, we, you know, we have our studio audience here as well. And uh, Marshall, I can see a lot of fresh new faces here ready to put in uh, their points of view. Uh, but first of all, like we do on most of our programs, uh, we're going to take a quick video report. So our team went out to take a listen to the word on the street. The U.S. education system is in a period of great reform. There is a great debate throughout this country regarding greater teacher accountability, standardized testing, and competing on a world standard. With almost 25% of US students dropping out of high school, and that number as high as 40 to 50% in the Hispanic and African American populations, our Secretary of Education has called this a dropout crisis. What is it about our education system that makes turning out successful graduates so difficult? In recent films and documentaries, We've seen the struggle and heartbreak of American families as they have to go through high-stake exams or lotteries or paying beyond their tax dollars to get a good education. It seems that a good education is still a premium in the wealthiest country in the world. Much of the blame is being placed at the feet of teacher unions, unmotivated students and parents, as well as a bureaucratic school system. The federal government has taken a more active role in the public school system. In 2001, the No Child Left Behind law was passed, and many state governments have enacted laws that link student performance to incentives for the teachers. So what does the public think about all this? Let's go and find out. No, I do not think the American education system is failing. Do I think it has shortcomings? Yes, of course. Uh, it's difficult for me to tell you. I went to private school, but where I went to school it was good. I think there are pockets of success and pockets of failure. I think there's a real gap between the success and the failure. Um, some areas are having really good success and some areas are failing miserably. I would say the public schools, absolutely not. Uh, the private schools, I think, are excellent. They're very expensive, they're very exclusive. I went to the public schools and they were great public schools when I went. So I wish that they would be the same today. How many dropouts do you think there are in the U.S. every year? 20%. 17 to 35%. 250,000? It's a good number. It's actually about a million. 
as far as private, where I, I mean, 100% of us graduated, so. What do you think, you know, some of the problems are? Certain type of people get the best education in the world in this country, but that education is not open to everyone. Number one, I think it's uh, language. I think that everybody coming into this country should be like our ancestors did, learn to speak English. Teacher quality and training and retaining good teachers. I don't know, I think it starts at home. If I told my parents I was dropping out, they'd beat me to a pulp. You have problems with community engagement and family engagement. I think I think there's a lot of the the onus on a child's education should be within their local family and community. And in a lot of places in the country, you know those those traditional relationships have broken down. So that was the word on the street. A lot of different views there from uh, the general public that we spoke to. And um, Eric, if I could start with you, uh, getting the discussion going. First of all, can you give us a basic overview of what the education system is like over here in the US? Sure, um, it, unlike many other countries in the world, the United States has a, uh, an education system that's governed locally. So we don't have a national education system like many countries do. Um, most of the policies, most of the decisions that are made are made at a, at a very local level, not just by states, but by individual counties and in some states, even by small townships. So my wife, for example, went to school in a, in a school district in New Jersey that was only one square mile. Really? So when you're talking about trying to change the U.S. education system or challenges in the U.S. education system, it's a very diverse system depending on where you are in the country and what state you're in. So it's actually broken down to a, lo a lot of different levels. Exactly. Because it must be difficult to change all of them Exactly. At once. Exactly. That's, that's the biggest challenge when you're talking about education reform. Okay. Now, Dr. Basir, what's your role in the whole education system? What do you see yourself as? Uh, well, at the local level, I, I, I train teachers mm -hmm. uh, in, in the university I work at. We have a teacher education program. And we have about 500 students and actually work in the area of educational technology. So I teach teachers how to use innovative and new technologies in their teaching and also how to design instruction around modern, modern methods and, and tools. Okay, and looking at the whole sort of education system as a whole here in the US, how do you value it? Do you think it's pretty good or do you think it has its flaws? Uh, I think the, the, the system, we, we have to see it in, in, uh, in a multifaceted way. So when we're talking about public schools, um, there's, there, there's a lot of diversity. So we have some schools who are doing extraordinarily well. And then we have some schools that are not doing so well. They're not serving the needs. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about it, I think about it as a mixed mix bag. I'm appreciative for the fact that we have schools that are doing extraordinarily well, but I'm also sensitive to the fact that we have those that are not really succeeding and need to change. Okay, David, turning to you, as a, you're a student at the moment as well. How do you, how do you find schools and schooling over here? Yeah, I definitely agree. There, there are very successful schools and schools that aren't doing so well. Um, I recently graduated um, from our K-12 public um, system and now I'm at a public university in the state of Maryland. Um, so I definitely do agree um, with being able to make decisions locally, um, being able to change things on a small scale, getting involved in your community, um, because the United States is a very diverse place um, and what works in one area may not work in another. Um, so I truly believe in that and I think that we have to build things from the ground up because there are areas that are doing well um, But we really do need to hone in on the areas that aren't doing so well right now Okay, and uh, just give us a bit of background. How did you get onto the State Board of Education? And what, what was your experience when you were there? Yeah, I served as a student member on the State Board of Education and um, all the student governments in Maryland come together every year um, and they have the right um, in law to elect two finalists mm -hmm. whose names go to the governor of Maryland right. and he actually has the uh, responsibility to select one person um, that serves a one-year term uh, on the State Board of Education as a voting student member while they're a high school senior. Uh, Eric, I mean um, what we're hearing is that there's a fantastic education system here but at the same time the commentators who are pushing for reform so why is that? Are there certain failings? Well, you know, I, you need to recognize that, that within the public system, you have schools that, that are incredible schools, that, that compete with the best schools in the world. Um, but there are a lot of flaws in the system as well. Um, we have many, many children here in the United States who drop out before they get a high school degree. Right. Um, we have an achievement gap between uh, white and Asian students who tend to perform better in school and uh, black and, and Hispanic students who tend to perform not so well. And we have a huge challenge with an increasing population of immigrants coming to the United States, many of whom um, don't speak English as a first language. And so they're coming in classrooms where English is the language of instruction, right. and the schools are having to adapt and figure out how to make sure that those students aren't left behind. So even though we have schools that are being very successful, we have, have huge national challenges that we're having to deal with. 
And I actually understand that you, have, you know, you're uh, a teacher as well. Or mm -hmm. you're currently teaching, or have you finished? Yeah, I, 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 I teach middle school history, and, and I teach in a school that's sort of ground zero for the type of education reform issues we're talking about. Right, right. Half of our students live in poverty. Um, <coughs> Ninety percent of them are students of color. More than half of them originally came from another country. So, you know, the, the school I teach in is, is the type of school where we're confronting our biggest challenges and having to learn to adapt our system to the needs of our kids. Okay, Dr. Fasi, is that something that's happening all over the U.S. or is it in... Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, what, what we're facing across the nation is that the, there's a very high dropout rate. Uh, we have maybe a, a third of our students who are struggling to stay in school and, and are not succeeding. Uh, when you, especially when you look at the urban populations, you look at African Americans and Hispanics, you're talking maybe 40 to 50 percent. Some of the statistics tell us are dropping out. They're not staying and they're not succeeding. Um, so in general, we see this as a nation, as a crisis. Uh, and so in that context, we're seeing a lot of efforts to try to deal with that um, from testing and accountability issues and those kinds of things. Okay. Okay, well, we've got a small audience here as well, so I want to get their points of view in the discussion as well. Um, turning to you guys, looking at the whole education system here in the US, uh, what are the advantages and what are maybe some of the disadvantages and areas that we need to improve? Uh, can we have a point of view over there? Yeah, please. Yeah, certainly, well, I'll give you my example here that um, I moved here from Pakistan when I was uh, um, about 14 years old. So I went to high school here and I did my undergrad um, here. Um, high school was much better experience as far as uh, the level of education goes, but then when I went to community college and four-year school after that, a whole different experience. I had to work full-time. Cost was a huge issue, so yeah. um, I had to pretty much pay for my education. I still ended up with a lot of loans. So um, as far as where I am financially right now, it pays off, but um, you know there are areas of opportunities that can help out. Okay, uh, I'm gonna get some more points of view, just generally the whole sort of education system, what do you think? Uh, uh, I'm currently uh, at a community college as well. Uh, mostly just the opportunities, there, there's numerous and endless opportunities. I mean, at any age you see like uh, people of all ages actually at you know, school getting their education. Um, and then the you know, just vast majority of what we have available, internships, uh, the National Institutes of Health, uh, any fields, government-supported agencies. Um, so you think there's actually quite a lot there for students? Yeah, so there's a lot to okay. do. You know. Okay, so what about on this side? Yeah, Gong, what would you like to add in? Um, in general, I think one of the positive things that panelists mentioned earlier was the diversity in the United States, and I think that's a very positive thing that uh, you could learn a lot from in itself. So when you go to school, you learn about uh, people of different races, different cultures, and you can learn from them directly. Um, on the negative side, you know, it was just mentioned that, you know, if you have the money to, it seems like you have to move to um, an area where the schools are very good. And if you don't have the money, it's luck of the draw and you're kind of stuck with uh, whatever schools are there. Then maybe they're good, maybe they're very bad, and you don't have the financial means to, you know, change the situation. So, okay. in general, right. I think that's... Thanks a lot for those views. Uh, earlier we were talking about sort of dropout rates and stuff. Um, you know, why is that level so high at the moment? What, what's the key issue? Is it that the school is not engaging or that they are distracting? We're talking about uh, inner city life and having maybe uh, just, you know, one parent families that they're coming from. What, what do you think are the main issues? Uh, Eric, turning to you. <laughs> that's a, that's the million dollar question. And, and if educators could answer that, we'd be able to solve the problem better. It, there are a lot of issues. I mean, right. one of it is, part of it is, I, I mean, with some of the students I've taught who've dropped out in high school, it's simply their parents need them to help work to, help make sure there's enough money to feed their okay. families, you know? And when you're in a situation like that, education becomes secondary, right. um, you know? And, and what this gentleman here was saying is, is absolutely true. We, we have um, a situation where many of the kids are showing up to school un, unprepared to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, they, and it's, it's not through any fault of their own necessarily, but if, if they're not getting enough food at home and they're coming in hungry, they're not going to be ready to learn. If, if they're going home at night and there are, you know, 15 people living in their house that, you know, they're not going to be ready to learn necessarily because they want to have a quiet place to sit down and do homework. So, you know, in addition to education reform and fixing the schools, we do need to be talking about ways to, to try to solve wider problems in society and provide health care better and provide food better to people who need it. We as a country don't do a good enough job with that. Right, okay. Dr. Pasi, what do you think? How would you um, well, well, definitely, uh, we know, you know what, what are some of the indicators of uh, likely dropouts. And a lot of that has to do with class. A lot of it has to do with 
uh, poverty, um, with, with access, with whether or not the first generation finished high school themselves, you know? So we're, we're dealing with a lot of those issues at the social level, but I think another thing that makes our system peculiar mm -hmm. is that in the United States, we believe that it is the right of everyone to go to uh, secondary school. And since we're a wealthy country, we, we advocate for it, and, and there's a sense in which we pay for it, right? Mm -hmm. So what that means is, unlike many other places, there's no sifting. You, you don't take an exam coming out of elementary school to go to high school. What that then means is everybody is in high school. Okay. And so <clears throat> motivation is a factor, mm -hmm. right? Because if, if you know, you're, you're supposed to be there, but you have no culture of being there, you're not ready to be there, but the system wants you to be there, then sometimes you find that that also contributes to whether or not people stay. I drop out. I mean, uh, David, what have you found at the high school and stuff? Yeah. Like, are oh. people dropping out because they're not interested, they're not motivated? I think that's a lot of it. I do think a lot of students drop out, not just because they're not interested, but because they don't see the relevance of what they're studying. Um, they don't see how that's going to apply to really anything um, that they're interested in doing in their future. Um, but another thing um, that I think is a problem uh, is that in Maryland and, and I, I suspect many other states, um, you're allowed to drop out at 16 years old. Um, and most students graduate from high school at 18. Okay. Um, so what we're saying is that the expectation is not really for all of you to go through or else we would ask that, that you have to be 18 um, in order to drop out. So I think that's a huge problem. We're allowing students to do so. Um, in the states that do have uh, laws at uh, say 18 years old, um, there are many exceptions, um, whether you need to work for your, for your family, um, whatever the case may be, and I think they're raising the dropout age is a huge, a huge thing. I mean, one thing you touched upon there about is relevance, the relevance of education. How do we make education relevant to people and show them that it's important to just be educated about general things in life? But one of our challenges in the United States is, I, I can answer the, the hard question, but I think a part of our challenge too is, in our society, we value people who work their way to, through school, right? Um, so it's not uncommon, for example, to have somebody who is going to high school and you know, working at the local McDonald's. And, and that's okay in the United States. In fact, if you're 16, you can get a driver's license and, and, and get that, that job, and, and sometimes your family's proud of that, and that's what they want to see you do. But of course, that gives you a whole different series of responsibilities that might not be school-centered. Mm -hmm. So I think a part of the, the how problem is what, what some, some school districts do, they have co-op programs. So in the last two years of high school, they'll say something like, well, you could work half time and then get some of your credits half time. Right. And that life experience counts as well. So there's some strategies that we can use because of our individual nature to increase that rate. The other thing too, that even though the dropout rate is high, we do have a, we have a system for remediation. And so you have some people who will go and get their uh, GED um, and, and that's a kind of school leavers program afterwards, right? Okay. So there are opportunities because there are so many other distractions as well in our society. Okay, uh, Eric, what kind of programs are there in place to make teaching and uh, education more relevant to youngsters? You know, I, I think the biggest challenge with that has to do with the education schools and, and, and the sort of work that our universities do. Um, it's incumbent on teachers to make it real to kids. And I teach a subject that a lot of kids don't find relevant to their lives. I mean, I teach to, to my sixth graders, I teach ancient history. I mean, these are right. things that happened thousands of years ago. Um, and it's really a part of the skill of teaching, making sure the students feel like they're getting some of, something out of it that's relevant to them and, and to them personally and to what their life is like. Um, so th that's a matter of training and, and, um, and of our education schools working to make sure teachers are ready to deal with that and not just stand at the front of the room and lecture. I mean, mm -hmm. that old model of teaching is a model of teaching that, that doesn't work for the, the broad base of students we have in the United States. Okay. So, I mean, if the actual style of teaching needs to change, how are we going to do that? Well, it is changing, mm -hmm. um, okay. partially because the education schools have done a good job at, right. at moving it in the right direction. Um, but you know, one of the biggest things I think that, that we have to change um, is working with our teachers in, in order to train them, prepare them to work with diverse groups of students. Because we still in the United States, even though Montgomery County, for example, where I teach, um, we are a majority minority school system. More than half of our students are members of, of a minority group, and right. it's a diverse set of minority groups. But the vast majority of our teaching force is still white, and they come from a different background. They usually come from a, a wealthier <coughs> background than a lot of our students. They're okay. not necessarily prepared to deal with students of different backgrounds. And, and so the education schools really need to push that as a major part, a major component of teacher training. 
Okay. Uh, Dr. Lucia, is that something that you think is actually in progress at the moment? Are people focusing uh, and yeah, changing? Yeah, I think, I think you're seeing a lot of that. Uh, you're also <coughs> seeing, though, uh, technology as a big driver. I think a part of what technology has done is that it has opened up the potential for schools to change in a way that we weren't thinking of before. Yeah. But think of uh, with technology as well. Teachers seem to always um, you know, blame it for everything. Um, in terms of poor English, their kids are going online on, all the time, they're playing video games. So you're actually saying technology has helped education. Well, I think what it has done is that it has helped to provide space for differentiation. Okay. And if what we're talking about is each individual learner learning at their own pace, which I think is a part of why it, people think of school as, as irrelevant, mm -hmm. right? We're trying to teach a whole group of students and my challenges are a little different than that other guys. So technology allows us an opportunity to speak to each and every student's need. No, 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 as Eric rightly said, a part of what we're struggling with with schools of education is how do you do that effectively mm -hmm. by, and still maintain interest and not become so over, overwhelmed by all of the things you have to do that you don't do it well. Mm -hmm. right? So I think training is still a very big part in professional development is a huge. Okay, let's get some more points of view uh, from the audience. We've been having a discussion so far. What do you, what do you think are the important points that have been coming out uh, from this? What are the roles of technology? What are the roles of teachers? Mm -hmm actually engaging students in, in schools. Yeah, let's get some points of view from over there. You know, basically, uh, I had the opposite experience. I came from Europe, and uh, European education seems to be the pinnacle of edu education, and I, I believe it still is. Uh, when I was, uh, it was more than a decade ago when I was at school there, uh, but when I came here to the States, uh, I went to a high school for one year, and to me, it was a, a culture shock, first of all. And then also, a, uh, you know, it felt like I was almost back five or six grades. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so it was, it was a very different environment. And I think the environment, school environment in general, that's basically the student's social life, because that's where they spend most of the time, whereas we spend most of our time at work, right? So that's basically their social platform. And I think it's just because of the current media and current uh, exposure that they're getting, whether it's from movies, TV shows, music, uh, pro sports, sports in general, uh, uh, or video games, it all comes out on that platform. Mm -hmm. And they're so preoccupied with things that they don't need to worry about or that, that are not going to get them very far in life that they, I think education is not even a secondary thing for them. Okay. Right. I think it's, it's uh, you know, a lot further down the road. Okay. Let's get some more points. Uh, the gentleman in front of you, if you'd like to just. Uh, well, <coughs> for myself, uh, um, I mean, you know, uh, I came from Pakistan and um, I was doing my um, um, undergrad over there. And I came here and I started uh, kind of all over again. So it was, uh, um, for me, it was a, a very nice change to begin with. Uh, one thing I would like to mention is that um, it was kind of very a lot easier for me uh, to get started here because um, uh, back there, you know, you have to kind of memorize all the curriculum for the whole year and be prepared to write a paper or uh, or exam at the end of the year. But right. here, it's like kind of breaking down into uh, a semester system, so it's like easier to understand and hold on to the, you know, uh, whatever you learn okay. uh, during the education. Okay, all right, exactly, thanks for those views. One of the gentlemen picked up on assessment and exams and things like that as well. I wanted to pick up on that. Um, some people say that, you know, our kids are being examined too much, they have too many tests, they're under too much pressure, they're constantly revising and that it's not healthy for them and that we shouldn't be educating our students in this way. So I'd like to get the panel's perspective on that. What, what do you think, would you agree? Uh, David, I mean, you're in, uh, as a student at the moment, what do you think? Are there too many exams? Um, there are a lot of tests. There are so many different types of tests. Um, there are tests that are mandated on state and national <coughs> levels, but then there are also tests um, that you just need to take to get into college um, or other things. I think there are a lot of them, but I think they're really important. Um, I think that they're important to assess where individual students are, but also um, to see how different demographic groups are doing, how different schools are doing, different areas. Um, so I think that they're kind of a necessary evil. I think that they do take a lot of time out, um, but they are really important to assess where we're at um, because if we weren't uh, at the end of the year, we wouldn't really know um, how much students were actually grasping okay. um, of what we've just gone through. I mean, this discussion is happening in the UK as well, and people are being, uh, you know, they're quite conscious of the fact that they're introducing more and more tests. Um, I heard a test 
there was plans for a test to come in for kids as young as six uh, to find out if potentially they would be gifted in the future so that they could, you know, sort of uh, almost fast track them into a certain route. And, you know, the people saying that this is the best way if you find, find out young enough that these, uh, these mm -hmm. children are naturally talented, we can actually help them. But on the, on the other side of it, you know, these kids are only six and seven and they should be playing around and, you know, personally, I'm not sure if that's, you know, a lot of people will be comfortable with mm -hmm. examining kids like that and, you know. Definitely too much anxiety, I think. Mm. But, but at the same time, I don't want to come off as sounding uh, as if I'm, I'm anti-testing, right? Because, uh, you know, one of my personal pet peeves, sometimes I'll, I'll hear students say, well, I'm not a test taker. And so I'll, I'll ask my students, who happen to be mostly <coughs> teachers, so, well, well, is it possible for you to dislike something and then teach a group of students how to succeed at it? So you don't like the tests, right? And you're not a test taker and you wish they would all go away, but you have a battery of students who need to, to show gains on these tests. So there's a part of me that thinks that the, 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 as an establishment, as educators, we need to go through some soul searching as well. You know, oftentimes, especially if you go to lots of our schools of education, we don't like to give exams because our students complain so much. Right. Um, but these are students who will be testing other kids in two years or a year when they graduate. <coughs> so I feel like there's some hypocrisy there that we have to deal with our, okay. on our own too. All right, I understand. Um, just looking at uh, this whole sort of culture of testing as well, I mean, um, there's going to be a lot of people watching who are students at this time. And uh, are there any sort of practical tips you could give for how to deal with stress maybe, the, the pressure of tests, and what's the best way of dealing with that? You know, I, uh, before I became a teacher, I actually taught SAT training classes. The SAT is the, the, uh, one of the tests students can take to help get into college here in the United States. And um, <coughs> the, I think the best piece of advice I ever gave um, was to get a good night's sleep and <coughs> eat a good breakfast. And it's really the basic stuff like that that can make a difference for somebody taking a test. Um, and, and to remember that it's just a test. It's not, you know, it's not the end of your life. People get very stressed out about especially the college application test. And that's not just unique to the United States either. Um, but you know, there's, there's always another opportunity or another route or another way of doing things even if you don't perform well that particular day. Okay. Um, David, just briefly, what kind of uh, advice can you give to other people who may be going through tests yeah. at the moment? I mean, I, I agree. I think that one test is never going to determine um, your success in life, whatever the case may be. If you're applying to colleges, grades, extracurriculars, <coughs> Um, and a million other things go into um, what they look at. And many of those tests, like the SAT, can be retaken, I believe, as many times as you want. <coughs> so I think that just understanding that, that one test is not going to determine everything for you. OK, okay thanks for that view. Well, uh, we have to take a short break right now. But uh, stay with us for part two. We're going to be carrying on this discussion of the education system and having a look for the future as well. How can we reform it, and what steps do we need uh, to take? For that, so uh, just join us in a few minutes. We'll be back with part two of Real Talk. The Review of Religions is one of the longest running religious magazines. In print since 1902, it continues to play an important role in presenting the noble teachings of Islam, reflecting its rational, harmonious and inspiring nature. It features articles and viewpoints on different religions, making religion and religious philosophy accessible to a wider readership. The Review of Religions was founded by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, who claimed on the basis of divine revelation that he was the promised Messiah and Mahdi, whose advent had been foretold by the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, and by the scriptures of other faiths. The annual subscription of this unique and enlightening magazine is just £15 per year or 30 US dollars. To receive your copy of the Review of Religions, visit our website at www.reviewofreligions.org where you can browse past issues and subscribe online or contact us by email to info at reviewofreligions.org. The Review of Religions, a unique magazine of religious thought. An interlingual channel promoting interfaith dialogue worldwide, live and interactive. 
on satellite television and the internet. This is MTA International. Welcome back to part two of this edition of Real Talk. Today we're looking at education here in the US. Uh, Eric, if I could turn to you first of all. We've been looking at reform of the education system as well. But do you think there's actually any dangers uh, in reforming the system? Maybe we're doing it too quick, or maybe it's going too far. I, I, I think um, you know we've got a lot of challenges, and, and we're at a place right now in this country where people are looking at many different possibilities for solutions to those challenges. Um, and I think the United States has always been a country that solves its problems in very messy ways. So um, I, I think that that. You know, the testing movement in particular, I have some criticisms of. I have some criticisms of the voucher movement here in the United States. Um, but I think, really, we need to seriously discuss all of these ideas and, and come up with, with a, a, a middle ground, a, a path that we can take towards, towards fixing our schools. Okay, Dr. Psi, what's your view on it? Um, I, I agree. I, think, I, I don't think we're going fast enough. But I think we, we, we need a balance of uh, the local and uh, national federal policies as well. What we know about education in the United States uh, so far is that some of its greatest challenges have been dealt with, with pressure from uh, local groups, local people, and also with uh, strong federal mandates. You know, and, I, and I think about uh, the 1954 Brown versus Board desegregation decision that was in part very strong local pressure and advocacy, but also the, the fact that the, the the, the courts took a position on the fact that schools should be desegregated. So do you so think actually the, the reformation of school system has started since back then and it's... Well, absolutely. We've always been a school system in the making. I think that, that's one of the interesting things about our public school system right. in the United States. It's, it has always been a school system in the making. Okay. It started out serving, serving one very particular need, although there was a vision that was greater than it. And so it's kind of grown to, to meet each step of the way. It's tried to include different groups of people over time. I mean, so David, so we've uh, established then that the school system is constantly evolving. Where would you like to see it go in the future? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure uh, exactly um, where I'd like to see it go, but I think that there are a lot of components um, of it, whether we're just talking about parents and families being involved in their child's education, taking ownership of it, um, whether it's just um, as a country prioritizing it um, so that everyone is clear that education is a very important thing so that students are actually um, aware um, of why it's so important, of what it's going to mean, um, the impact of their, on their life, um, and just trying to recruit quality people into the teaching profession. Um, we talk so much about education, but um, not a whole lot of people grow up wanting to be teachers. It's not a, a glamorous profession. Um, they're not paid a whole lot of money. Right, right. Um, so I really think we have to change a lot of mindsets about education to get where we want to go. Yeah, I think a lot of people remember back to their high school days when being a teacher was, you know, probably not the best thing. You, wanna, <laughs> wanna, you don't really want to go back into that situation. Yeah. Um, but, you know, is the classroom situation changing these days? Are we still talking about getting basic discipline in classrooms as well? I mean, that's a, that's a constant with teaching. I, you know, you go back to the first classrooms that existed in the world and right. discipline was an issue. Um, so there are some constants. I mean, there are some things we're, we're still trying to deal with, but there are constantly new challenges, demographic changes. Technology has brought huge changes to how we teach and what we teach and, um, and what we prioritize. I mean, in the United States now, when I was young, which wasn't that long ago, we were still teaching cursive. It was required. We don't even teach cursive in the schools anymore because people write almost everything on computers now. So, you know, there's, there's sort of this tension between the, the constancy that we have in a lot of elements of our school system and, and the change that, that we're seeing and that we need to see. Okay, Dr. Siebel, do you agree with him? Well, well, well I, I, I definitely agree with, with Eric uh, <coughs> and David, but, you know, I think one of the things where I think we, we lack a, a state of urgency is we've, we're at this juncture as a nation, we've failed to recognize what I think of our, as two important things. One, education today is a human right. Mm -hmm. And right. to be spending lots of money on schools that are not working, especially for your minority populations and your urban populations, your rural populations, that's a, to me a violation of uh, someone's human right. You, you're not educated, right? So you're always constrained. The other thing is we talk about national security and we have an economy that's completely, at least for the last five or so years, has been really chugging along, almost crippled. And to me, 
that makes education a national security issue as well. Mm -hmm. So we're quick to spend money on wars and we're quick to spend money on lots of other things. But for me, education is the key. How does a generation, a nation, make and remake itself with peop without people of knowledge? And so I think there has to be more urgency and I don't see that in our nation as much as we should. Okay. Uh, David, I mean, Dr. Bazzi touched on about the, the economy. Do you actually think, uh, you know, one day when you actually graduate and you get a job, are you worried about your prospects um, as a career, uh, you know, as a graduate coming out into the, uh, the career market? How, uh, is, is that a worry for you that you might actually get a job because of the recession and things like that? Absolutely, I definitely think so. I think if you look at the statistics right now, students that are coming right out of college are, are having an extraordinarily tough time. And I think that's why a lot of them have actually gone on to pursue further degrees, um, graduate school, law school, um, whatever the case may be. But I think it is a huge issue. The statistics show that students come out of a college, um, it's probably um, as hard as it's ever been to get a job um, straight out of school. So yeah. Okay. Um, another question just for the whole panel, all of you. I mean, the fact is that some people just don't really care about education. They're, they're not really interested in it. They don't really want to, they don't really see it as a, a, a means to an end, really. And uh, how, do we, how do we get them on board? And how do we actually stop them being maybe a, a bad example to other people? Because what we find is in some classrooms, there's only one potential person who's, who's causing trouble and, and other people might, maybe they're watching at home right now, their students, they're in classrooms, they know that they want to learn, but you know, there's this person who's always causing problems for me and how can they deal with that and how can they, because before we were talking about sort of um, the behavior in class and discipline, I think that's linked to that as well. How, how can we get around uh, issues like that? And are we tackling that enough? You know, I, I think there's two different issues here. Uh, one is <clears throat> issues like you're talking about with discipline. Um, and that's a tough nut to crack. And I really think that's a matter of really engaging the parents with the school. And, and the schools have a lot of work to do in, in that area. But we have a broader political problem because, you know, we do have a public education system. So it's a political issue funding the system. And I can't tell you as a politician how many doors I knocked on where I would start talking about my background as a teacher and how education was important to me and, and had people say, I don't have kids in the school, the schools don't matter to me. Um, and, and that's a really serious problem. I mean, you, you go back to the founding fathers and Thomas Jefferson arguing that education is the most important thing we need to have a functional democracy. That's a real threat to our democracy when education isn't important anymore. And it's a threat to our economy as well. So, you know, I, I, don't, I wish I had an answer, <laughs> but it's a big problem that we really need to So in those situations addressed. where parents actually take their kids out of school, do they take it upon themselves to educate or do they just you know, tell them to get a job and start contributing to the family economy? We, we, um, well, most of the people I'm talking about are people who, who don't have any involvement with schools anymore. The kids are older and graduated in most right. cases. Um, but yeah, in the United States, we have the public system, and then parents are able to send their kids to private schools, which right. cost money. Um, and then there's also a large and growing homeschooling movement where the parents themselves educate okay. their children at home. Um, and, and so you've got a, a patchwork education system in a lot of ways. Dr. Psy, what's your views on, uh, on home education? And um, interesting question. Well, you know, I, when it comes to, to, to education, I'm a big advocate of uh, diversity in the system and choice. Mm -hmm. So for me, home education is critical, especially for families that feel uh, that the school is not serving their needs. Um, and, 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 and I liken it to this, right? The, the, the state takes your money, so they take our property taxes and they say, well, we can educate your children. If you fail in that, then you should naturally give me an out. Okay. So for me, an out would be you know, a voucher program. Uh, or I educate my child and you give me the cash, right? But I, I don't have a, because I think that's a part of what we have in a democratic society. We have choice. Yeah. And to deny people the choice, especially when you're not providing an alternative. But with homeschooling, kind of the, you know, the problem is you're taking kids out of a social environment. Right. You, you know, they're not having that interaction with other school kids right. as well. So that's got to be a huge well, issue. Well, that's not always true anymore. Um, okay. and, I, and I'll give some examples. <coughs> One of the things that's, that's emerging is the virtual school. And across the United States now, uh, we have virtual schools that are basically online schools. Uh, and they're, they're, in, many of them are hybrids. So what school districts do, is you attend a virtual school maybe two days a week, where you go to an, you attend a, an actual school maybe two days a week, and in the other three days, you go virtually online. So they watch the curriculum, you're going through a regular curriculum, yes, mm -hmm. with your parents at home, but those other two days, you're getting your socialization with your classmates, with a, right, with right. a teacher, those kinds of things. Um, 
And, and, and we also know, by the way, that when you look at a lot of the, the statistics, it is not true that homeschool children are actually antisocial. Okay. In many cases, they're actually quite more social mm -hmm. uh, because they, they come from a situation in which they're highly valued, uh, their voices are heard. Right. Uh, so they, in, in some cases, they're actually quite precocious. precocious. They're quite mm -hmm. adult. Interesting, okay. Uh, turning to the parents that are here in the audience, uh, how do you feel about your school kids, your children going to school and growing up in that environment? Are there any issues that they've faced? Can I get some, uh, some points of view, any points you'd like to add into the discussion? I, it was mentioned earlier about achievement gap between uh, white students and minority students, particularly African Americans and Hispanics. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that other minority groups, uh, particularly Asians, seem to do very well in school. And I'd kind of like to ask the panel is, well, what, what is the reason for that? And is there a lesson that can be learned to apply to other minority groups that seem to be struggling? Okay. So we'll ask that question in just a moment. I just want to get some other points of view as well, and I'll come back to that. Um, just at the back, so we've got some guys here at school as well. Uh, what kind of pressures are you facing? And, um, what kind of difficulties do you have? school uh, let's get some points of view uh, I think the pressures that we face is like like expectations of getting high grades and like and, and not like doing bad in school is that from your parents you get that pressure? yeah all right okay coming back to, to earlier to this uh, gentleman's question about some uh, groups of people actually do better in school and, and, and why is that and so can I get the panel's point of view on that Dr. Basir uh, well we, we do recognize we know that in the United States we uh, we have a interesting uh, achievement gap uh, across some ethnic groups. Uh, we have attributed some of it to, for example, how relationships towards authority. Uh, many of our Asian, Asian students, they come from homes in which the authority is given a certain kind of mystique, you know? So when you, when you go into a school, the teacher is always respected and uh, held in high esteem. Uh, many of our other minority populations, as well as our, our, our national group uh, are very democratic. So they don't necessarily think about the teacher and the school in the same way. Um, the, the, the values that, uh, much of this is value related, you know, uh, and, and I'll, there's, there's a, a documentary recently where they actually compared like three groups of, three, six kids, right. two in India, two in, uh, 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 in China, two in the United States. It's called Two Million Minutes. What do you do with the two million minutes of high school? And what we found very quickly was that what we valued in, our, in, 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 in the culture, in the United States culture, is very distinct from what, what other minority groups might value. You know, African Americans, Hispanics, it's not like they don't value education, they just value their freedom too, right? Their, their, their desire to, to be self-expressive and these kinds mm -hmm. of things. Uh, and then coming from situations in which, in some cases, homes in which education is not thought of as necessarily a way out, in the United States it's not always thought of as a, a way out, uh, then that kind of changes the dynamic. Asian students are, are pretty much on point with the idea that, look, I listen to my parents, I'm going to do what they ask, and you know, my life is about that. Mm. It's not the same yeah. across the culture. But at the same time, it's, it's important to remember that even, I mean, and we know negative stereotypes can have impacts for students. Positive mm -hmm. stereotypes can too. And, and there are plenty of Asian students who fall through the cracks of the education system because they're struggling and teachers look at them and say, oh, they're, they're an Asian student, they'll do fine. You know? and, and, and so you know, it's important that even though we have this achievement gap that's, that's, uh, that breaks down along ethnic lines and other achievement gaps break down along other lines, um, we have to be careful not to stereotype every individual kid as being part of that. You still, at the classroom level in particular, have to remember that every kid is an individual and has their own individual experiences. Yeah. I mean, Dave, just bringing you in as well, I mean, we discussed that the classrooms are becoming more and more diversified. So I guess we can actually learn the best bits from everyone's culture and, and bring that together. Yeah, you would hope so. Um, and I know that a lot of things that he mentioned are very true. Um, sometimes groups uh, like Asian groups, they place a very strong focus on education and that's reflected by the amount of effort that students put in. I mean, just take a daily homework uh, assignment in many classrooms um, and the, the amount of time put in, the amount of effort put in um, drastically varies. So uh, you can see why someone that values it more, um, works harder, puts more into it is going to succeed. Um, so that, that is a big thing and um, a lot of other groups w w would be better off if we could kind of incorporate some of those values that are being uh, brought in from those cultures. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm yeah. talking about a real quick example, right? Uh, college sports, right? Um, in a culture that values it, 
do extraordinarily well. We, you know, African Americans don't need any affirmative action policy in sports, right? College or high school. Because high achievement is valued across the community. You play well, you, you dedicate yourself to practice. This is just what you do, so you can do well. So when you twist that into academics, it's kind of conceived a little differently, mm. right? And of course, it doesn't necessarily help, by the way, that when you do look at sports, you see so many of us. So you see a lot of our kids, they'll tell you, you know, yeah, I like the books, but come on, I play ball so yeah. well, I think I could go get that scholarship if I tried hard enough. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. We had a whole separate program about sports when we looked at that. That was a big aspect of it. Um, just moving the discussion forward a bit, one thing that's becoming quite popular in uh, schools in the UK, I know, is the, the ones that are failing, um, the government actually is introducing things called uh, academies, uh, where they actually take the school, they pass it on to uh, another company who will take over it and, and sort of rejuvenate it. Um, I understand you have a similar sort of system here. Right, we, we call them charter schools. Charter schools, right, right. that's right. Um, so I'd like to get your views on that. Do you think that's a good way of actually um, helping failing schools? Well, I think the first thing is not to see it as a silver bullet. You know, for a long time, we, 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 you know, we, we think of our problem in such a way that we, we keep looking for one fix uh, solutions. And I think we've done that to an extent with charter schools. What we're discovering now is that uh, they're not necessarily doing any much better than the local okay. public school. Um, they have some of the exact same challenges. Uh, they've dealt with those challenges differently. Um, uh, my, my biggest worry for them is that they've become uh, a tool with which we value, we validate segregation. So if you look at many charter schools across our nation today, uh, we've kind of reversed Brown versus Board, which said that schools should be desegregated um, because many charter schools are black and Hispanic. And we have almost said that it's okay yeah. because you know this company said we're gonna set up this school and we're gonna help these families and everybody just kind of said, well, okay, fine, you do it because we can't do it. Mm. And so now what you have is a school with 90% Af uh, African American or 90% Hispanic or other kind of variations like that. And they're yeah. still not doing as okay. better. Uh, David, what's, what's your view on yeah, I on like charter, charter schools school. to an extent. I think that they are a good option to have because in some of the areas where we have charter schools, um, the schools are performing at remarkably low levels mm. and taxpayers deserve other options um, where they want to send their students. I don't think that students and families are forced to go to these charter schools. Um, so, like I said, it gives them different options in different schools uh, that they um, can choose from other than uh, maybe their neighborhood school if they don't feel like they're going to get a good opportunity there. Um, hopefully, if we put them into a new situation that they opted into, maybe they'll have um, a higher level of interest and uh, they'll do better. So I do think it's a, a decent alternative. Okay. Uh, I mean, Erica, if, if this isn't the way to go, then what is the way to go for failing schools? How do we... No, I mean, that's, that's the question everybody asks. I mean, the, Part of the difficulty here is, is the silver bullet problem. Everybody's looking for the one solution that's going to fix education, whether it's testing or vouchers or charters. And, and you know, the reality is that we have a, a massive system. This is a, a country of hundreds of millions of people, you right. know, a massive education system in this country. There is no silver bullet. There is no one fix that is going to solve all of our problems. And as long as the media and the politicians are looking for that silver bullet, they're not going to be looking to do the complex work that's going to be necessary to, to really address some of the problems in our schools. Okay. Uh, just briefly, I really wanted to touch on the whole cost of education. Uh, that's becoming a, a growing issue. Uh, obviously here you already are used to paying college fees. Um, in the UK just recently, you know, there were big protests about the, the ongoing rise of um, the fees to go into university. And some people think, you know, it's not actually worth it. Uh, which is, you know, it's, it's a shame. It's a worrying trend. So just, uh, just briefly, I wanted to get the panel's uh, response to that. Do you think there can be ever, um, there should be a limit on how much we should pay to go into college? And, and do you think actually sometimes you don't need to go into college because at the end of it, it's, it's not actually financially viable? What's your point of view? A lot of people have different views on this topic. I would argue that there are some people who are able to um, find good careers without getting a college degree. I don't think that that should ever be determined by your ability to pay for school. And, no. and frankly, uh, you know, I sympathize with the protests that have been going on in the UK. Education should be cheaper in the United States. There are far too many kids who don't go past high school simply because their families can't afford it. And, and it's closing economic doors to them. It's closing doors to them in terms of their life, their lives. And, and as we've seen the economy 
have problems here in the United States, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the state budgets and the federal budgets have run into trouble, we're starting to see some of those college costs go up even more. It's, it's going to make college even more unattainable to, to far too many people. So personally, I think college, um, both four-year colleges and community colleges, should be less expensive here mm -hmm. in the States. Dr. Say just briefly, what would you like to um, well, well, I do think, uh, yeah, we, we, we have a serious overexpense problem in our college system here. In fact, uh, the, the Congress recently, I think the Senate recently put together a panel to investigate, especially we have these private for-profit colleges and, and they're really gouging out the eyes of, of, of people. That said, in the United States, we do have a very strong system of uh, subsidies mm -hmm. uh, that I think work fairly well. Uh, to me, it's not so much that whether or not everyone gets to go to college. It's really a case where if you look at most of the things that we must do in our lives today, you know, so let's say you, you know, let's use one of our professions that we don't think of as needing lots of education. Uh, let's think of farming, for example. Um, when you look at farming, even though you may not need a college degree to be a great farmer, you need at least the equivalent of two years of, of, of college. Why? Because there's so many things that farmers are interested in now more than just what's happening in their local village or their local town. Um, so that kind of extends the need for some training beyond high school. Okay. And I think we, 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 that, that needs to be there. But, I, and I have a little different take. I think one of the reasons why we, we end up with higher priced schools is sometimes because of the government subsidies, right? And this is kind of rough, but what, what, what we have is, you know, if, if you put a bunch of money in a corner and, 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 and we say the government says it's, it belongs to you so you can take it to college, a college pops up and says, well, I'll get you in because I really want your money. And even if you're not qualified, right. and lots of these for-profit universities, I've seen them do it, you know, you're not qualified. <clears throat> you couldn't get to one of the local colleges. Even for a semester, charge you 10,000 bucks, then kick you out on the street. And so a part of it is government learning how to manage some of this money that it doles out. Okay. Right. Uh, David, just turning to you, I mean, everyone, I guess, wants free education, but... I guess you have to be realistic about the actual costs of it. Someone has to pay for it, right? Yeah, and colleges are an exorbitant cost, um, but when you look at things like community colleges, those are much more reasonable, um, and the difference in price is really, um, it's, it's a huge difference. Um, and I think that even though college does cost a lot, we have seen in the long run, um, it really um, is worth it if you are able to, to do so. Um, it pays off in the long run, um, occupation-wise, but we do have to look at ways to bring the cost down um, because there are a lot of students who are not able to go into college strictly because of money, um, not because they couldn't succeed um, or even do better than people that, that can pay to go. Um, so it's uh, a really unfortunate problem. Okay. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up uh, the program just shortly. I want to get some final points of view from the audience. Um, one thing that I think has been uh, quite uh, interesting in this whole discussion is the role of parents as well as teachers in terms of education. Um, I want to get some sort of views from the audience on that and just general perspective on the whole discussion that we've had today. Let's get some people who haven't said something yet. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to put forward um, their view. I think one of the trends that I've seen in the US, I, I did my bachelor's in Canada, is that um, a lot of the cost of college, uh, what I see here is this trend that kids have, they say, when I go to college, I have to go as far away from home as possible, possibly to another state. And you know the out-of-state tuition cost is a lot higher. Um, even uh, where I'm living right now, uh, there's a couple of guys I know. They're going to a university in the same town, uh, University of Texas in Austin, and it's barely 15 miles from their home. But they don't want to live with their parents, so uh, they move out of their home, and then they rack up this huge debt. And when they graduate, they have like you know 40, 50 thousand dollars in debt. Right. Um, so it's part of the problem is the students themselves too. So. Okay, and uh, let's get one point of view uh, right from the back as well. If you'd like to just... I think uh, throughout the discussion, I think two points that were very apparent. Um, you definitely have to have motivated students to, to get an education, and you have to have motivated parents. Um, so the two, those are two main points that I thought, you know, definitely there needs to be a cultural change or something to, to move right, on. Fantastic. Thanks to everyone in the audience as well. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, what would be your final remarks from the, uh, from the panel here in terms of the discussion we've had today? What, are the, what would you like to leave our viewers with, final comment? Well, um, you know, in, in the interest of, 
uh, a politician in a democracy. I'm, I'm glad to hear that people have different opinions about different things. And, and you know, it's a complex issue and a difficult issue. And it's a conversation that we need to continue both in the United States and, and around the world because we all share the problem of trying to find ways to make sure that our kids lead better lives than we led ourselves. Okay, right. uh, Dr. Steve, just very briefly. Um, well, well, I think from, from my perspective, I, I always think that our school system will evolve or become radically changed if more people are involved in its growth and in its development. Uh, and I think the fact that we can have this discussion is, is very good, and, but, I, but I always always advocate, you know, I ask my students, who want to be teachers, how many of you have ever been to a school board meeting? How many have visited your local school board, just sat around, listened to what they were talking about, and I would leave the audience with the same charge? Uh, become interested in education, uh, because it's not only for, for your kids and for yourself, but it's for your neighbors as well, for the entire nation. And in a society as open as this one, we need people who are active and engaged. Okay, and David, what would be your final comments for today? Yeah, I just think it, that it's very important that we have all of our stakeholders um, weigh in on all these topics. We don't want change coming from one group or another from the top down. Um, teachers, principals, the general public, students all weighing in, um, giving their perspectives. Once we get a fully um, well-rounded debate, only then are we going to be able to figure out what is the right direction to move towards. Okay, all right, fantastic. I want to thank the whole panel for your involvement in the program today. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience as well for your input. And uh, don't forget, you at home can put in your points of view as well. Our email address is there for you at the bottom of the screen. We've got our official website address as well. And also, you can follow us on Twitter for the latest Real Talk news. Uh, we're coming to the end, not only of this program, but also of the whole series here in the USA. We'll be, inshallah, try and do one or two more programs. Um, but I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's been helping over here. Uh, we've had a huge team behind the scenes. And uh, so I just want to say thank you to them for their involvement. Inshallah, we'll be back with more Real Talk. Uh, but until the next time, assalamu alaikum.